Um, today our main scripture passage will be in 1 Corinthians 7 from verse 32 to 35. And let me ask you guys to please go ahead and turn there. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32 to 35, right? So we're going to continue our series on mission, motion, and maturity. But we completed mission, the mission series about two weeks ago. So today is going to be the second lesson with regard to motion, right? Um, just one announcement. I was just reminded. Um, our brother, Patrick Caesar, is hospitalized at this time. Some of you guys may know. Um, perhaps he has to undergo surgery, right? So I want to encourage you guys to please be keeping Patrick in your prayers at this time. I know there's a lot, a lot of stuff happening. Just talking to different ones of you guys I know. I mean, even me, you know, I've like suffered losses and stuff. It's been tough, you know, but God, is, God has been faithful in the midst of it all. Um, he's always in control. Let's go before Heavenly Father in prayer this time. Holy Father, we are so grateful to come before you. Um, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, God. Thank you so much for life, for health, for strength. We take some of these things for granted, oh God. We thank you so much um, for your son, Jesus Christ, for his wonderful sacrifice on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be reconciled to you. We could have relationships with you and we can have relationships with one another as well. Father, be with us this morning as we look at your word. Open wide our hearts and our minds to be receptive, oh God. I pray that your word will, will allow your word to transform us, God, to become the people that you desire for us to be, oh God. I pray that we will give our undivided devotion to you, for, oh God, you deserve it. My God, at this time we pray for the marriage retreat, oh God. I pray that you will bless the time that they spend together, God. Help them to draw nearer to you. Help them to be strengthened in their marriages, oh God. I know that um, Satan has done his work, a lot of stuff. You know, when it comes to marriage, not only here in Trinidad and Tobago, but throughout the world, oh God. Um, people take marriage lightly. They take their covenants lightly, God. But I already pray that um, you wrap your arms around them, God. Help them to draw nearer to one another as well. And it'll just be a great time of bonding and fellowship. And they'll take away, you know, your word from it. We pray as well for Brother Patrick Caesar this time, oh God. Um, Patrick has been a great servant here in Trinidad and Tobago, God. Um, I've known him since I became a Christian, God. And he, he has really helped me in so many ways. And I know that he's helped a number of people here, oh God. I pray, God, that um, you give the doctors healing hands, oh God. Grant them wisdom, you know, to do what is best in this situation, God. I pray that he gets all that he needs, all the resources that he needs, you know, to recover, you know, to be able to come once more into our fellowship, you know, to encourage us and to give you his best as well. Be with me as I preach your word this morning, God. Help me to do it humbly. Father, help me to do it with clarity. Help me to do it with the confidence that only comes from you, God. I pray that I'm not focused on being eloquent or, um, you know, saying the right words, but I allow the Spirit's power to guide me. Father, we look to you. We love you. And I pray all these things in the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32 to 35. And the title of this morning's message is Undivided Devotion. Paul writes to the Corinthian church here. It says, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman of virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you might live in a right way, in undivided devotion to the Lord. God's call for people everywhere is for undivided devotion to him. It doesn't matter our nationality, race, whether we're rich or poor, how many problems we have or we don't have. God wants us to give him all of our hearts. He wants to be the center of our attention, our primary focus, the being that we desire more than anything and anyone else. This morning, as we look at the scriptures, prayerfully, we'll, we'll 
will draw closer to living out God's will for us. Firstly, let me share some background and context. Right. So, in Acts 13, Paul visited the city of Corinth, and Corinth was a wealthy cosmopolitan commercial center. Many people became believers, and Paul stayed there for a year and a half to teach them. After Paul left current, they came to him. They wrote him some questions, some key questions. They had adopted the common Greek idea that physical things are bad, and this included marriage and the resurrection of Jesus, among other things. This affected the way that they saw marriage and the resurrection of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul writes that this world in its present form is passing away, and the most important thing in this life is pleasing God. For him, being unmarried meant um, less distractions in serving God wholeheartedly. Paul never condemns marriage, as that would be contrary to his words in 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3, where he warns about those who forbid people to marry. It's also important to note that Paul is not saying that a married person should not please his or her spouse. In fact, that's expected. I think you guys would agree. We'd be really concerned if a married man doesn't provide for his wife or married woman doesn't take care of her husband. In praying and studying this out, what I get most is that the things of this world, the things that we place so much value on, they are only temporary. Here today and gone tomorrow. But the man or woman who does the will of God has the promise of eternal life. You know, as much as this may hurt, even when it comes to our loved ones, as much as a person loves his spouse or their family, sadly we do not have them forever. And we've seen evidence of this in so much in recent times. This is hard for us to hear. It's difficult for me as well to think about that. You know, but it's the truth. And I think Jesus really put it in the right perspective. You know, one time, someone came to him and said his mother and brothers were outside waiting to see him. Jesus replied that his mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Brothers, sisters, and friends, we've got to live with eternity in mind. We are called to live in undivided devotion to God. And the thing is, like, when I look at the scriptures, I like to ask questions. And Corinthians is a book that they can ask a lot of questions. There's so much going on in the church in Corinth. These people actually came from a pagan background. They came from a Greek background. You know, they didn't come from the Jewish culture. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff happening. If you read, I mean, just like a lot of stuff. Um, I'll keep it G for a G-rated audience, but um, there were divisions in the church. One person followed the Paul, one person followed Apollos, and so forth. So many things were happening, you know, and I mean, it looked like, it looked, it looked like so much was happening. Um, so my first question was, what is undivided devotion? You know, I thought about it. I looked at other passages. I examined people's ideas as well. You know, and I came up with this working definition, undivided devotion. Um, I would encourage you guys, um, the thing about it, you don't have to take everything, don't take my word for it. Like, this is my working definition. So what I want to encourage you guys to do, I mean, you can take it up if you want, is to study it out yourself, think it through, and see what you arrive at, right? Undivided devotion. Completely committed to the true and eternal God and not the idols of this fallen, temporary will. And the thing about it, idols um, are not only physical idols. They are, you know, there are things in our hearts as well. You know, and we could be devoted to these things rather than being devoted to our creator. Right? Um, so my next question would be, why should I live in undivided devotion to God? I'm a logical kind of guy. I think most guys are logical. We like to ask a lot of questions. We don't just follow and stuff. And sometimes, um, because of that, guys get, get, guys, guys get a bad rap, like going to school. We don't just like take what people see. You know, we like to ask a lot of questions. So my next question is, why should I live in undivided devotion to God? Right? So, um, these guys are ahead of the game this morning. I'd rather tell them. Next slide. Um, for me, he is the creator. I mean, and I could have just put a full stop there. Um, I would want to follow my creator. Um, the person who designed me knows what's best for me, what's fitting for me. I know I'd want to give him the best, you know, and live in undivided devotion to him. 
Then it goes, I mean, if, if, it, if, it, if that's not good enough for you, it goes on. He possesses incomparable qualities, love, wisdom, power, holiness, and the list is not extensive. You know, this is the God that we serve. And determines my eternal destiny. That's important to me. Um, let's look at Psalm 145. Right? This calls to attention some of God's qualities. So I'll focus on the second point there. His incomparable qualities. Psalm 145, and this psalm has become one of my favorite psalms in the last four years or so. So we're going to look at Psalm 145 from verse 1 to 10. Give you guys a few seconds to get there. And David writes here, I will exalt you, my God the King, I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. So, the question I put there was, why should I live in undivided devotion to God? And I said, he possesses incomparable qualities. I mean, you see our extensive list here, and again, I mean, it, it's, it's missing things like perfection and so forth. Um, so I wrote down so many things that I really appreciate about God. It says, great, from the psalm. Um, David goes on to say he's mighty, which means God has the ability to do anything. Goodness, righteousness, free from guilt or sin. God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. So God is forgiving. He's concerned. He's patient. He's sacrificial. And I really like it when David says, the Lord is good to all. I don't know many people that live that are good to all, but this is what the Lord is. The Lord is good to all. So for me, it's pretty easy to do my best to serve this God with an undivided heart. And I hope that you guys feel the same way as well. So moving on, and this is the crux of the matter. How can I live in undivided devotion to God? Right? So, I'm guessing, I can't look behind me, but I'm guessing they have this slide up there. Um, how can I live in undivided devotion to God? Focus on being a man or woman after God's own heart. I think that's key. Um, we could act a certain way. A lot of times we, we learn how to act. We learn how, what the right things to say. I mean, the thing about me, um, like growing up and stuff, um, I, I try to be polite. I was taught to be polite. You know, to everyone around me, I can't pass my neighbor. I, I can't pass my neighbor straight, right? Um, and I was well commended for that. You know, um, neighbors would come and tell my parents, you know, that you know, Shulan is like polite and different now, different to typical person. Not that I'm saying this to boast or anything, but I'm just saying it to share that um, I know how to. I know, generally I know how to act. Um, I also read a lot of books you know, on behavior and stuff. And I mean, this is something that I pay a lot of attention to, you know, how they interact with people and stuff. Um, I, my, um, I'm introverted by nature, but I really like people, I really like relationships and stuff. So I, 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 I kind of look, look a lot at that emotional intelligence, I go into courses and stuff. So I generally know how to act, you know, how to, the right ways to say a lot of times, you know, if, um, if I'm going to talk to somebody and I have to, I have to tell you something, um, I won't say harsh, but after, um, let's say, challenge your character, I know how to sandwich it, how to say something nice to start off. You know, you're a great guy, I really appreciate you. Then I hit you with what I need to hit you with, 
And then I'll close up by saying, but I think you can improve it. I, I know you can improve. I know you can do it. I know the right things to see. But hearts is what really matters. Because we could have all the correct actions as Christians, but it really, we're going to be shown up, you know, if we don't have the heart. So that's the key thing there. Um, and, because, and we are allowed to make mistakes, and I'm going to share a little bit more about, you know, being a man or a woman after God's own heart in a bit. Right? So some of the things you can do is strive for a deep, real relationship with them. And that includes Bible study, prayer, and obedience. Right? Love and serve others extravagantly. I learned, I didn't really learn the word extravagantly this week, but I, I saw it in um, the message. I was like reading some, some uh, scripture on Jesus, examining his love, and it talks about Jesus' love was extravagant, and I really liked it. You know, it shows that it's real laid on now. You know, real given in, in extreme measure, just in love. And I think for us servants of God, we need to love extravagantly as well. Um, use talents, abilities, and resources to advance his kingdom. I know we spoke about, I spoke about it when we like three weeks ago. You're using your gifts to glorify God. Um, flee from sinful and corrupt practices of this world. Um, we live in Trinidad and Tobago, so we're familiar with these things. Sinful and corrupt practices, I mean. And it's not just exclusive to us, but to the world at large. Um, so I said I was going to share a bit about a man after God's own heart. Um, a man or woman after God's own heart is not perfect. Um, that's for sure. You think about David. David is described as a man after God's own heart. I think after Jesus... No one is praised or lauded or applauded in the Bible more than David, King David, um, Israel's greatest earthly king. The thing about it, you might ask, but how could David be a man after God's own heart? David sinned terribly. He committed deceit, murder, adultery, you know, and hopefully we won't go there. Um, Paul had a thorn in his flesh, you know, and we're not sure whether it's physical or spiritual, you know, commentators differ in their opinions. Um, what we know is um, he pleaded with God to take it away from him. You know, he's like a messenger from Satan to torment him, he said. And the thing about it is God's, Jesus told him, my grace is sufficient for you. So that's why I say a man or woman after God's own heart does not have to be perfect. You don't, you don't have to be perfect, you know. Aim for perfection, but you're going to fall short. You're going to miss the mark. If you never miss the mark, um, Jesus died for nothing. Um, I'll share personally. I like, I like to share my life. I like to be honest about it. Um, one of my biggest challenges um, before I became a Christian was addiction. Um, addiction, alcohol, impurities. I started as a teen. Um, I'd say for the alcohol, it's like casually started. Like maybe I was like in Form 4 and stuff. And like going to school parties and stuff, starting drinking with my friends and stuff. Um, that, after I left school, that spiraled out of control. And I mean, I went to places that I, I didn't want to go and I didn't want to go to. You know, places that I felt ashamed. You know, places that are, it's, it's, it's real, it was really challenging. Um, I, had to exa I examined myself. You know, why do I struggle with addictions? You know, and even now as a disciple, I mightn't drink alcohol and be a whole impure and all this sort of, sort of stuff, but there's still the addictions, you know, that personality. I could fall into a pattern if I do something um, consistently, I can fall into a pattern, you know. It could be like eating for comfort and all, all sorts of stuff, different things. You know, I could actually, many things I really like is music. So I can actually listen to music, um, sometimes shorty nights. You know, I've done that at times, just listen. And I say, there's the last song, there's the last song and not ready to go to sleep. That, that's addictive, and it, it's harmful. Um, so I asked myself, I, I you know, had to ask myself, because it's good to find out the roots of your problems. Sometimes you might think, you know, you have these challenges. Um, for youngsters, a lot of times they might give trouble. They might have a son, he's acting kind of weird and stuff, and you might want to know, why, why are you giving so much trouble? It's always, always good to find the root cause. And I only found this out like, I mean, it was kind of obvious, but I only um, paid close attention to it a couple of years ago. Um, even here, and a guy share. And when I was growing up, 
I had a good relationship with my dad. He was, he was cool and everything, like, he take me out and stuff, and like music. So he, and in my days, they didn't have CDs and things. There was records, and he would buy stuff like that, and I liked to play music and listen to it with him and stuff. Um, but the thing about it, he wasn't always there. My dad um, worked, um, he worked on sea vessels. So like, he was away for extensive periods at times. Um, and some of those times were times that was key in my life. I remember um, sitting, coming entrance, and be going into first form, and he wasn't there at the time. And I used to get along great with the guys, I mean, good and stuff, but I felt I was insecure. And I realized the reason I was insecure, because I didn't have my dad around. That was, real, that was tough for me. And that continued to like key times in my life. Even when I became a disciple, my dad wasn't there, he was working offshore. Um, when I left home as a disciple to move into a household, he wasn't there. And so I replaced, um, to numb the pain of not having my father there, I turned to things like impurity and alcohol. You know, that was, that was a big challenge for me. Um, so now, even as I strive you know, to be a Christian and to be a man after God's own heart, there are challenges. And I have to look out, I have to look out for triggers. When I'm bored and I can get bored quickly or lonely or under extreme pressure, you know, I have to be guarded. I have to know myself, right? So I'm, I'm sharing this with you guys to show you this is a real thing that even if you strive to be a man or woman after God's heart, you're not going to be perfect. You're going you're gonna to fight. You have to fight, you know? So essentially, that's why I'm sharing this. Um, so I'm going to focus on the first two items there. Um, strive for a deep relationship with them and love and serve others extravagantly. Let's turn to Hebrews 5 from verse 7 to 10. Hebrews 5 from verse 7 to 10, and you're going to see Jesus here. You're going to see a pattern, right? Hebrews 5 from verse 7 to 10. It says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the ones who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience on what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. The thing is, we see a pattern in Jesus' relationship with God here. The passage says that he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to God. You know, um, question again. When was the last time you guys prayed with tears? You know? Have you ever prayed with tears? Um, a man or woman who wants to be completely devoted to God must be real with him. You have, you have to be real. I mean, this is Jesus here. You have to be humble and honest with God. There's no other way to deepen your relationship with him. Um, I really like Jesus. I mean, it might sound real cliche, but you know what? I'm always inspired when I read about the life of Jesus. Um, in the gospel, it says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Um, another one in the gospel says that he spent the entire night on a mountainside praying to God. So if Jesus, who in very nature is God, lived constantly in prayer, then it can't be no different for you and me. Um, there's so much to pray about. There's so much to pray about. I feel like in recent times, um, I want to, I want to, can I say I don't have enough time to pray? It's just so much. I can't pray. The time that I assign myself to pray, but I pray constantly. But like, if I pray in any morning, there are so many requests to pray about. You know, there are, um, there are people who are sick, people, um, families of lost loved ones. You know, um, people ask for so, have so many requests. So like, it's, it's just so much, so much to constantly be praying about. Um, I usually pray in tears sometimes. Well, let me, I, I, I was praying to God first, um, like, when I got up here, I say, um, Lord, help me not to use, uh, let, well, let me not be eloquent now, but I just realized I make a mistake there. So, I said I, I pray to God sometimes, usually, or something like that. But the thing is, um, I, I usually pray in tears, you know, um, 
because I feel like I have a lot to be grateful for. When I come before God, I might, maybe I'm, I'm emotional by nature. Um, so like when I come before God and I think about all the blessings, um, I've, I've just been blessing a lot of ways. I mean, I feel like people around me real love me now. Like even today, well, not today, um, this week, I sent out like, Telling people my heart was broke. Well, not my heart broken, but I'm going through a rough time now. Physically and emotionally. So I sent it on a broadcast list to about 50 people. Right? And real people respond. People tell me they pull, they pull up and they pray for me. All sorts of stuff. And I mean, I was encouraged. People call me and stuff. Um, so for me, that's a real blessing. Um, I have a fancy haircut, right? I like fancy haircuts. <laughs> from St. I'm a teen. Uh, going somewhere with us. Yesterday, I went by my barber. And... I started cutting my hair by him since 20, 2001. So, we were real good. Yesterday, he said, he told me, all right, I'm not an emotional person. <laughs> he told me, tell, tell me that now. But I really want to say I really appreciate you. You know, um, we talk about our whole range of stuff and things. And some of you guys would know him because a lot of you guys find my hair because it's nice and thing, and you guys started to go there by him too. Now. So, <laughs> So some of you guys are doing, right? Um, so yeah, um, so I feel really blessed in a lot of ways. But um, I felt real challenged, um, like in the last two weeks, you know. Um, one of the guys, one of my coworkers, he lost his wife. And some of you guys wouldn't know her because she's, she come out to church a couple of times, you know, when we're here in Cipriani. Um, another one of my coworkers, last Sunday, he passed away. Um, He's young, he's like 30 something. He may be early 30s. Um, he died from cancer, he was actually, and the sad thing about it, he went to Columbia for treatment, and he couldn't make it back. I mean, he, I think they'll send back his body, but he couldn't make it back. Um, that was tough, and I had my own personal things to deal with. So, the challenge with me was, I wanted to cry on work, but I didn't, I couldn't, even lunchtime, I say I could, go, I could probably drive out and you know, go by Marcy or something, and maybe when I drive by, that's not, sometimes say, there's places you can't, you don't want a guy sitting down in a car being emotional. Could be, you know? People might think all kind of thing, they might want to call um, all, all sorts of agencies and stuff. So it wasn't, it wasn't healthy. I wanted to make the gospel look attractive now. So I had to read, I had to wait, and I was real busy, you know? I really want to cry, but because it's real hard now. So I end up, um, and when I got home, I just, it just all came out, boy. I just cried out to God. God is real tough, boy. Why is all these things happening? And you don't always get the why, the answer to why. But you could ask God, what can I learn from this? Well, how can I improve? It's just real tough, you know. And just talking to different people, you know. People even in here have lost loved ones. Um, so, yeah, you could constantly be praying. There's so much to pray about. You know, this is the atmosphere which we ought to live and breathe. Um, also in my relationship with God, and I, I, I can only share about myself of more than anything else, like when I'm sharing. Um, I like to have fun with God, because I feel like he's my friend. I really want to treat God as my friend. You know, it's not like a distant relationship, like only serious or anything. I mean, I see the humor in, my, in daily life, the things that God does, you know. I ask for small blessings. You know, I ask God, God, let me sh show me how much you love me today. I really talk to God, because they say he's our father, you know, and when I pause that, he says we could say Abba, father, you know, which means daddy, dada. You could talk to God like that. Um, so that's prayer. Um, Bible study. I didn't have, I um, mentioned Bible study. Um, I think we need to go deep, you know, study of the Bible. Um, again, we have so many resources available to us in this time. Um, if, if, we, if we lack depth, it's, it's our own fault. I, I really appreciate what Tyron shared last week, that we are responsible for spiritual development. I'm a firm believer in that. I mean, nobody could stop you. you no know one. I mean, there's, and I mean, we are free in, in our country, Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, nobody looking for us, hunting us down because you're reading Bibles and so forth. There's so many resources available online. I mean, I went on Bible Gateway this week, and it's like, if you subscribe, I mean, um, I consider it a moderate fee compared to the things that we might spend money on. We have a, you have a whole set of um, 
study resources there. Um, so many things. Um, and I also think we need to make a greater effort to obey. Not just study the scriptures, because we can know the word of God, but we need to make, strive to obey the word of God. Be disciplined. I think that's one thing that we need to be. Be disciplined and show reverence for God. You know, our, our disposition before God should always be one of reverence. That should be our posture naturally as Christians. You know, when we come before a king, uh, discipline in different things. In our time, um, even when the times that we come to church being punctual and stuff, um, that's a big thing I find for us. Yeah, you know, sometimes you look around, the service starts, and it's just empty seats, empty chairs. Sometimes the people on the stage is the majority of people in the auditorium. And that's real. And I mean, I'll share it because I love you guys. You know, we need to be really disciplined with our time. And the thing about it, eh? why I can share this, I'll share this. The guys who serve are the ones who are here early. The guys who serve are the ones, and they're constantly, they're constantly here, the worship team, the ushers, and so forth, you know? I mean, think about it. If these guys um, were not here, if you guys came to service one day and you didn't see them, how would you feel? You know? I mean, these are the guys who are serving me. So, I mean, if they can do it, you guys can certainly do it as well. Um, one of the things I notice, and I, we always speak to the teens about this, is taking notes. I might sound like a real school teacher here, right? Um, Kunta asked me one time, where well, I did the word study with her. He asked me, you teach or <laughs> do you teach? Um, I don't. Well, actually, I had to teach a lot, like train people like on work and stuff at different points. Um, take notes. We encourage it, um, the teens all the time to take notes. You know, I mean, I, don't, I can't remember everything that somebody shares. And I think we get a lot of material. You know, the guys who come up here and they share and they preach and stuff, they share a lot of stuff, you know. Um, I remember hearing scriptures that, wow, these are my favorite scriptures. I don't go back and you know, um, write them down and stuff. Um, I know some people take notes, but I don't know if um, it's the majority, that's in the majority, you know? Um, whether, I, whether you're at church, devotionals, family or group lessons, family group lessons, sorry. If you take notes, if you, I mean, it's important. If you go to a class, and a lot of us have gone to different classes, you're not going to go without some um, instrument to take notes. And this is, lab, this is about life. This is like key. Um, always be in learner's mode. This is something I've learned as a young disciple. And I'm going to share a bit about being a young disciple just now. Always, I remember one of the guys who I really appreciate stuff, he always tell me. And this might sound kind of, well, I won't say funny. He said, you have to be a fast learner. No, you have to be a quick learner on a fast track, and I never forget that, you know? I mean, we all different. Some people like certain things and so forth. Some people don't like to read. Somebody was telling me about that. They don't like to read. You know, one of the teens still taught me, um, you have um, the Bible app. You can, put a rec you can listen to the recording, and I do that a lot. Like, if I had a speaker about something and I want to have that script in my mind, or I, I play it while I drive, and, you know, you don't always have, you have, as I say, a wide variety of resources. Um, so I'm going to finish up there, right? Um, love others extravagantly. I said I really like that word. Big love. This is the heart of God, you know. God doesn't hold back in his love for us. And I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 to 12. I think Paul is a guy who really modeled, modeled love. It says, in, I'll actually take it up from the um, second half of verse 7. He says, just as a nursing mother cares for children, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of our holy, righteous, and blameless. We were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Thing is, Paul, I, I really admire Paul. He didn't only share the gospel, but he also shared his life as well. 
Paul is just an amazing guy for me. And I like, probably I have my favorites in the Bible. Um, some of the guys that I really like, like David and Paul and stuff. Um, what I like about Paul as well, how he starts his letters to the churches. Um, he really encourages these guys. You know, he hopes that he could see them. He hopes that he can meet them face to face. He's so encouraged by how they're growing. And the thing is, you would think that they're the best thing on the, on the earth. You know, Paul starts off his letters. But the thing about it, a lot of times these churches were in so much sin. You know, but he still encouraged them. Um, he knew that they shared in God's grace with him. Um, I could talk a lot about love, but we spoke about love a couple of weeks ago. But one thing I wanted to address in love is to love our young converts, people who became Christians in recent times. And I might be a little generous. I would like to say like five years and stuff. You know, um, honestly, these guys are an encouragement to me. You know, every time I see, I see Cheryl smiling already. I tell her already. I, I mentioned that I go share about her. Um, she's like a real encouragement to me, like to continue to, to, do, to use my gift. She really encourages me, you know, continue to preach, you know. That sort of, I really appreciate that. I appreciate Kunta as well. Like I say, Kunta asked me if I was a teacher now. <laughs> and every time I see her, he's, he's, like, he's, he's like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, good, it's good to have people like babies now. You really like the younger ones and stuff. You like to see them coming out of church, you know, giving, smiling and stuff. I really appreciate these guys. Let me tell you guys, I want to share a little bit about when I was a young Christian. Oh, I forget to mention Devante as well. Devante is a guy who really wants to learn. The thing about Devante, um, I have a great relationship with his parents. His daddy said disciple me as a young disciple now. And like, you know, some things continue to generations. So we have a great relationship. But he really wants to learn now. He's like, he challenge me at times. Real challenge, real. Ask real questions and stuff, right? So, um, maybe like two weeks ago, Devante, I went to a study. And the other guys can come who usually come to studies because they had exams and stuff, right? So, I sent Devante the, um, the notes beforehand electronically, right? So, I tell him, you will take notes from me. So, like, when we finish the study, now we're driving back. So, I say, um, Devante, how you felt like the study went? Now? And he shared with me where he saw any study and stuff. And then he said, um, you know, at one point in time in his study, I forget to take notes. You know? <laughs> I was, uh, he said, um, I was learning so much in his study, <laughs> I forget I was supposed to take notes. <laughs> but he did, he actually did take the notes and stuff. But I really appreciate, I really appreciate these guys. You know, I just wanted to share, you know, to lift up young Christians. When I was a young disciple, I was real spoiled as a young Christian. And I mean in a good way, right? Um, if I, if I, um, if I had the cool, somebody go provide a napkin. That's a joke, by the way. Um, the thing is, right, but honestly, as a young disciple, I was real spoiled, you know. Um, when I came to church, I was sitting, um, up front, for the most part, I mean, first or second row. Um, somebody was next to me. They had a song book at that. We didn't have all the nice things like screen and we were in the looks at the time. Somebody had a song book. I had to, I know the songs, you know. Um, I mean, I could share real things, eh? Um, I, I asked real questions as a young disciple, boy. Because I used to go and read the, um, read the Bible and stuff. Um, there's one time I asked, this question started in the looks. It went to Memorial Park. Then it went to the house. So that, when it, that was a Sunday after church, eh? And even this guy who discipled me, he's like falling asleep on me now. But then in my mind, I said, they tell me to be a barrier and examine the scriptures. <laughs> and I asked them. Um, but I really was spoiled. Um, like, if anybody came, I was, in, I was introduced to every, everybody. In she, I was introduced to people. You know, I had to know everybody. And I couldn't sit. When I come to church, I couldn't sit down. I remember a time, like, as a young Christian, another sister became a Christian around the same time like me. And, like, one Sunday, we came to church in the looks. And because it was so ingrained in me, I said, sis, we can't sit down, you know. We had to get up and go and greet everyone. And that's how we were. That's, that's kind of training. When you get that, it boosts your confidence. Um, you think about as a young Christian, you're going to have some challenges. I had some challenges. I remember, um, I remember, I had, to, I had to, like, go to a function where I used to work. I used to work in the bank. And, I mean, that function had alcohol and stuff. And I drank alcohol. That's my challenge. 
And I felt a little tipsy and stuff when I drank it. And I, I was real good. I used to get along real good with people that I worked with. It's like one of the, um, one of the girls, she, she asked me to, um, we go, let's, go, let's go and um, hang out. But I said, um, I probably was going to go. But eventually, I never got, I didn't get to go, but that's God protecting me, right? And the next day, I was, I was, I was emotional. I'm an emotional kind of guy. I really like relationships. So like I said, um, and I'm coming back out the church, you know. I tell myself that I was, it was a Saturday night, the Sunday. I didn't, go to, I didn't come out of the church. I was probably like six weeks as a disciple. And the guy who disciple me came to my home and tell, you know, to bring communion as usual and stuff. And I told him, and I came back out of the church, and he was a real sad boy. I remember he left, he was real sad. But he, I'm, a so, I'm a kind of guilty conscience kind of guy too now. These guys invested so much in me. So I actually went to meet with them. Yeah, a lot of times we met, met in Port of Spain. So I went and I met with them in Port of Spain. And at that time, well, I think it was a men's day. A men's day that Sunday. And it's Angel Martinez. He was in town. And they were playing basketball. So after the basketball finishes now, Angel comes up to me and introduces himself. And he, say, he shares with me, um, like, you know, we talk now. And he says, um, I heard you're going through some challenges and stuff. And we, we, we spoke. He shared with me. He says, you think that you're going through? I went through that as well. He, he like, related to me. And he shared um, Abraham. Abraham, you know, even when he was called to give up Isaac, even though he felt challenged, he did it because it was for God. And that was so encouraging to me. I always remember that. And I was like a real turning point. So these are the kind of things that I got as a young And I mean, I could stay here and talk to you guys about this for like 15 minutes. I tell you, I was real spoiled. I get clothes, all, all kind of, all kind of thing. As a young, I get all kinds of stuff. Real spoiled. I'm um, saying this to say that um, we got to really take care of our young converts. You know, we got to love them extravagantly. You know, uh, I don't think we give them the energy that, um, that I received in the past. We really need to give to them. I mean, they, they, they are challenged, you know. It's hard um, moving from a life you lived previously to becoming a Christian. It's a real transition. It's, real, it's the, the toughest thing. You know, I, I felt it when I was a young Christian, and I know that they would feel it as well. Um, when I say love extravagantly, I really want to lift up you guys. I really want to commend you guys for the outpouring of love for Patrick Caesar, boy, yesterday. I just really want to lift you guys up. You know, people really um, try to give blood and stuff. Like... There's one time I was uh, one, I to put my phone on mute because I was seeing so. As one time I see like 50 messages on my phone, you know, in the space of like five minutes. But I said, now, nah, um, this is like, let me leave it. This is like a real, I just want to know what's happening. You know, this was like a real or porn of love. And this is the way that we need to live. We have it real hard, you know. Honestly, that, I say this a lot, eh? I have it hard, but I'll, I'll, I'll follow by saying, but God is faithful. We have a real, we are challenging lives. Our lives are real traumatic. Even our country, the type of things that we face on a day-to-day -day basis is real traumatic. The, um, the murders and stuff, they are close to home, you know. Um, so we really need each other. We really need to love each other. I'll say get discipled. I mean, just some quickly, just some quick things. Get discipled, get taught, you know, sharpen one another. You want to pre present one another, live before Christ. Love family. You know, you never know when, I always used to hear, I always used to hear, um, tell your mom that you love her when they're leaving home, because you never know, you never know. And people have shared this with me. I've went to, I went to the funeral of one of my friends years ago, and he says that he never got to make, when he was doing the eulogy, he said he never got to make peace with his mom. And he was, that was a real hard for him. You know, make time for your family, love them. So we had to get rid of a lot of distractions. You reach out to friends, reach out to non-Christians, people are hurting. Um, last year, I want to leave you guys with two contrasting examples from the Old Testament. This is like something I looked at maybe like 15 years ago, but it's real, um, it real stands out to me. Two contrasting examples from the Old Testament, lessons from Israel's history. In Judges 20, from verse 13 to 16.
Judges 20 from verse 13. And I'll take it up again in the second half of verse 13. <clears throat> it says, But the Benjamites, Benjamites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. From their tongues they came together at Gibeah to fight against the Israelites. At once the, the Benjamites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their tongues, in addition to 700 able young men from those living in Gibeah. Among all these, among all these soldiers, there were 700 select troops who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Remember that point. Um, so we go to 1 Samuel now, 17, and this is a real popular scripture, even from, from childhood days. It's like David versus Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm not going to read the entire passage. You can look at it if you wish. I'm just going to read a couple, less, maybe two excerpts. Of it. Right, but we all know the story of David and Goliath. Right? In verse 8 it says, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, you will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And let me take it up now in verse, verse 45 to 50. It says, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and, and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut your head off. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that this is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Like I said, most of us are familiar with the story of David and Goliath. The Israelites and the Philistines assembled to fight each other. The Philistine champion was Goliath, and the Bible tells us that he was tremendous in size and strength. Um, he challenged the men of Israel to battle him, and he did this, if you read it, for 40 days. No Israelite came forward, including King Saul, because they were terrified, they were dismayed. And why did I read the passage in Judges 20, a short while ago? In Judges 20, it says there were 700 left-handers who could sling a stone and hit a hair. Benjamites. Now, the thing is, maybe like one or two generations, I believe, had passed by, and the Benjamites were now restored to Israel. And you think about the amazing thing? Saul was actually from the tribe of Benjamin, you know? And there was a time when they were left-handers. You could sling a stone and kill and, and hit a hair, you know? And in addition to this, Israel had a reputation for defeating um, vast armies, sometimes armies um, that had greater numbers and that seemed more powerful, right? Um, Saul was a pretty impressive guy. If you read about Saul, it says he stood, uh, I think, a head above everyone else. He was a head taller than everyone else. In Saul's first battle for Israel, he actually slaughtered, uh, Israel slaughtered a lot of Ammonites. He was just an amazing guy, you know. He, was, he got so angry, I think he shut up some oxen and stuff. And Israel was able to defeat some Ammonites. Um, what happened? I asked myself that question. 
during that period, what happened when between the period they had these 700 guys who could sling a stone and hit her here? You know, why were they all terrified of Goliath? I mean, think about it. You know, you had, I mean, something is usually passed on from generation to generation. They were formidable in battle. And I believe it was because Saul was no longer devoted to God. You see, at this point in time, God had rejected Saul as king because of his disobedience on previous occasions. David, who was just a shepherd boy, walked closely with God. If you read David's words, you'll see he believed that he could do it. And David was fierce for God's honor, and even his brothers were jealous of him. He defeated Goliath with a sling and a stone. If this wasn't so serious, it would have been funny to me to see David, a shepherd boy. I mean, think about it. You are the king, and you're going to allow a shepherd boy to go into battle. And David, he gave him his, um, his armor and everything, but David didn't take the armor. He went with a sling and a stone, and he defeated Goliath, who all these guys, these guys who spent their days fighting, were terrified of. Was he lessening this for us? If we are not careful, if we do not live in undivided devotion to God, we can slowly drift. When this happens, we're not going to pass on the knowledge and the things of God in a way that we ought to to our children. The children were here a short while ago. You know, we're not going to pass it on to the younger ones. We're not going to pass it on to newer disciples. Worst case scenario, when we drift, we could actually lose our relationship with God. Today, I want to encourage you guys to not focus on the temporary things of this world, the pleasures of this world. Let's not focus on that. You know, for me, I want one day, because I feel like, as I say, I always say this, things hard. Life, life is rough. Sometimes you think you're going to get over this earlier because you gain this. Things are going to get a little easier. You're going to climb up now. It's going to be smoother. It's never like that. Things hard. So for me, after I go through all this torment and challenge in life, I want to go to say, well done, Shilon. You know, I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I want God to welcome me home with open arms. After all of this, it'll be worth it. Um, I wish the same for all of you guys. All of you guys sitting here. Some of you guys have been friends with for a long time. Some new friends, some visiting. I want the same for you guys as well. Um, brothers, sisters, and friends, let us live in undivided devotion to God. After all, he deserves it. You know, I love you guys, and let me say God bless.